Now that we're approximately eight to nine months into the COVID pandemic, we have seen amazing work by our critical care colleagues in reducing mortality in this disease entity. However, we still have further room for improvement, specifically in the area of respiratory management, whether that's before mechanical ventilation or upon initiation of mechanical ventilation. To this end, this talk is a comprehensive overview of what we know to date about best strategies in terms of how to manage COVID-19 respiratory failure. Thanks for watching and thanks for learning with us. Medical Specialists Associates, making medical education more accessible. Hi, my name is Christopher Viscopoulos, and this talk is on the comprehensive management of COVID-19 respiratory failure, in which we'll start with the basics of when to start supplemental oxygen on this patient population, when to progress the high flow nasal cannula and how to manage and monitor the patient's success on high flow nasal cannula, when perhaps maybe the possibly consider a trial of CPAP, why we're looking to avoid um, BiPAP in this patient population, when to consider intubation, how to manage mechanical ventilation in this patient population, when to consider tracheostomy and how to do tracheostomies in this patient population, as well as when to consider VV ECMO. So with that, let's start. But for a first slide here, let's make sure that we're on the same page in terms of how this virus presents and when this patient population presents to us in the intensive care unit. So this virus has about a five day incubation period at which time the patients become symptomatic with the most common symptoms being fever, cough, and maybe some dyspnea and maybe some myalgias. And then it's not for another seven to nine days or so that a patient would progress to respiratory failure. Now, this is interesting. This is about a 14 day period here that a patient has before they go into respiratory failure. And this might help explain some of the phenomenon that we're seeing in this patient population, which is namely something that we call happy hypoxemics. These patients can, uh, can handle hypoxemia better than patient populations that we have seen before in critical care medicine. They could have PAO2s from the high 50s up to 100, which normally would be severe ARDS. And they could be looking at you on their high flow nasal cannula like there's nothing wrong. Why am I here? When can I go home? And it's quite amazing. And perhaps maybe this 14 day period could help explain some of that phenomenon in which there is a long period of time that someone could perhaps maybe compensate to the hypoxia that they're experiencing. There might be shifts in their oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve with upregulation such as things as 2,3-DPG to allow for more oxygen unloading or perhaps other mechanisms which we haven't quite figured out yet. But the take home point here is that perhaps maybe this 14 day period does play a role in allowing these patients to tolerate hypoxemia so well. And down here, we break up uh, COVID-19 uh, illness into three distinct phases. The first stage here is a viral response. And then this is followed by a combined stage two, what we call pulmonary phase, both a viral and host inflammatory response. And this is where the patients begin uh, to go into severe ARDS in the critical care population and respiratory failure. And then there is a third phase, which is the host inflammatory response. Now, this host inflammatory response appears to probably be the bigger player in our critical care uh, patient population with upregulations of things such as interleukin-6, which might be driving the bulk of illness um, that we're seeing and why there has been focus maybe on trying to decrease some of that cytokine response. Now, this third stage is so important. There is even now recognized multi-system inflammatory syndrome um, in this patient population in which they could test antigen negative for the virus and antibody positive and still have an overwhelming host inflammatory response to where they continue with their ARDS and get worse. And so if you see an individual that's antigen negative and antibody positive, they might not be out of the woods. They might clearly be in this host inflammatory response phase over here. And what we see is that at the time of infection, again, we have about five days or so before they become symptomatic, but about 50% of the population does not become symptomatic. The infection just simply stops. Of, of these 50% of patients, 
that become symptomatic, it's mild symptoms. And about 80% of those patients recover. And it's only about 20% or so of the patients of these 50% that will present to the hospital. And of this 20% of patients, only about 15% become critical. 85% recover with really kind of uh, minimal uh, treatment. And it's this 15% of 20% of patients that we're going to uh, address as these are the patients that we're seeing present to our critical care units. So this respiratory failure, as I mentioned and alluded to with the happy hypoxemics, is really something that we have not seen before. And because of this, now we have really differentiated uh, ARDS into two distinct types to be able to better categorize this new respiratory failure that we're seeing with these patients. And so just as a quick review here, we see CT um, and chest X-ray findings of ground glass opacities, uh, infiltrates, and cravy paving, which is something that we see up here. And then what we have is we have two distinct types of ARDS that I alluded to. We are breaking this up into an L type and to an H type, of which this is not two completely distinct um, syndromes. It's really a progression from the L to the H. So the L type is a preserved respiratory system compliance, um, ARDS, in which they have compliance still of 50 milliliters per centimeter of water. And it's the H type is that reduced respiratory system compliance below 50 ml a centimeter of water. And it's the H type that we're really most used to, quote unquote, stiff lungs in the ARDS patients that we have been accustomed to see prior to COVID-19. And perhaps maybe this new phenomenon of the L type, this preserved compliance, might be due to thrombosis, microthrombosis, and or vascular endothelial dysfunction, and uh, perhaps maybe an imbalance between angiotensin II and angiotensin uh, I7. And again, the H-type is really that kind of classic ARDS uh, that we've seen before. So here in brief, the L-type is a preserved compliance uh, ARDS, and the H-type is more of that stiff lungs that we're, that we're used to. But again, not two distinct entities. There is a, um, a progression that can happen between the two. And as we begin to progress and we get to mechanical ventilation and other management of the respiratory failure, really what we want to do is we want to prevent patients from progressing from that L-type to the H-type because that H-type respiratory failure is just so difficult to treat and does have the highest mortality. So this is just a brief uh, overview of what we'll uh, go into uh, in detail. Um, upon presentation for this patient population, when they are symptomatic, we'll initiate nasal oxygen when their SATs fall below 90%. And we'll really kind of target about 92% or so um, on a pulse ox with supplemental oxygen. If that fails, we'll begin with high flow nasal cannula. And we can start at maybe 30 or 40 liters of flow or so and progress our way all the way up to 60 liters of flow. And in some machines, maybe even as high as 80. Um, and again, uh, where to titrate the FiO2, approximately 92%. We'll talk about what is failure and how do you categorize a high flow nasal cannula. We'll talk about when to maybe consider a trial of CPAP, uh, why we're avoiding BiPAP and the guidelines that are recommending it right now from our national societies. And again, intubation criteria. So we're, uh, a, as a first step, uh, we're gonna initiate this patient population on supplemental oxygen. But if they fail, then we go to high flow nasal cannula. And one misconception that I just wanna start with is that Yes, it's nasal prongs. Someone's breathing wide open uh, into their room. And there seems to be a misperception that that is a high risk event because then someone can see the room um, with viral particles. And indeed, high flow nasal cannula is all the way down here. Really, BiPAP and CPAP see the room much more, followed by nebulization, followed by simple face masks, followed by venturi masks, followed by nasal cannula. And then again, you don't get all the way down here um, until you get to high flow nasal cannula. Now, as we begin to discuss what high flow nasal cannula, it's these very high flows that entrain air in the back of the throat. And that likely is what helps prevent some of the aerosolization in that you have such high flows, it's preventing some of the virus from being expelled into the atmosphere. So since high flow nasal cannula is overwhelmingly important as a first step, 
um, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page into, in terms of what high flow nasal cannula is. And so it is a heated and uh, humidified uh, type of oxygen delivery to body conditions. And this is very important because the heat uh, and humidification uh, maintains hydration and mobility of secretions and the ability of the patient to preserve their mucociliary function. So they can have a normal respiratory system uh, functioning in terms of clearance on high flow nasal cannula. You have maximum flows depending on the machine you have between 40 and 80 or so. And this is uh, interesting because when you look at a dyspneic patient, they often breathe in very, uh, very quickly for their inspiratory phase. They, they really kind of need to get that air in. And it just so happens that the patient's inspiratory flow rates when they're dyspneic are about 40 to 60 liters per minute. And so that matches very well with the flow rates of high flow nasal cannula and could be a reason, uh, one reason why the patients have a lower respiratory rate on high flow nasal cannula. Again, because you're matching that inspiratory uh, flow rate that the patients have. And so what it does is, is it flushes the nasal pharynx during exhalation so that the first bolus of air during inspiration is not just expired air, but is partly freshened by the oxygenated high flow nasal cannula gas. It is soft, loosely fitting nasal interface that does not impede with speech and or eating. Now, this is really important because in the uh, COVID-19 patient population, up to 30% of patients can become delirious. And this might be due to some maybe microvascular thrombosis or other dysregulation uh, in their central nervous system. And the fact that the patient can more easily communicate with us, we can pick up on this earlier. And if they do ha start having uh, altered mental status, that's one of the early indications to go ahead and intubate. So this is an important point. And the fact that they can eat on high flow nasal cannula is important because this is a prolonged illness and someone really needs to be in this the long haul for the fight and adequate nutrition is important. Now that's in contrast to CPAP and BiPAP to where you cannot eat um, on those mechanisms uh, because it is a high risk for aspiration. Now, again, you have a reduction in the respiratory rate likely via two mechanisms here, which is flushing of the nasal pharynx which also washes out anatomic dead space which makes breathing um, more efficient uh, in this patient population. And you get like somewhat of a, uh, um, of a peep um, when, um, with, with this patient population um, with high flow nasal cannula. And you can calculate that peep. The expiratory expedience is a roughly one centimeter of water for every 10 liters of gas flow. So say if your patient is on 60 liters of flow, that correlates to about six a peep. And this also helps with slowing of exhalation um, by the inflowing gases. And this also could make someone feel a little more comfortable and act as a gentle recruitment mechanism. Now let's contrast this with non-invasive ventilation when we think of CPAP and BiPAP. So again, high flow nasal cannula is primarily a flow generator. And again, you get the high flows uh, more reliably deliver a targeted FIO2 in this patient population. Um, that needs high flow nasal cannula, and you reduce dead space with, again, improves ventilatory efficacy. Um, but non-invasive ventilation, in contrast, is primarily a pressure-targeted modality. Hence, it is pressure that is responsible for its success in its two main indications. The first one being acute respiratory failure and COPD uh, exacerbations by counterbalancing intrinsic PEEP with external PEEP and providing pressure support to assist in inhalation. And the second one that we're familiar with is acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema by applying CPAP or bilevel PAP to increase functional residual, to, uh, residual capacity, which improves oxygenation and lung compliance. But there are great difficulties with non-invasive ventilation, namely what we have now determined uh, and called SILI self-induced lung injury. Because again, since this is a pressure mechanism, the increased pressure could harm someone. And how could it harm someone? It can harm someone via two mechanisms. With high tidal volumes, where they go beyond a safe range, which is about nine uh, mLs per kilogram, and they could have stretch injury, uh, or they could have high respiratory rates, and they could, in essence, have breath stacking. And again, accumulation of pressure within their uh, chest cavity and lung damage. And uh, if this does happen, you have worsening of ARDS and you have cytokine release, and this could happen within hours. And this is one of the concepts I alluded to earlier to where 
we want to prevent patients from progressing from the L-type R to the H-type Rs. And it appears as if BiPAP can particularly uh, cause this type of harm in this patient population, which is why we try to avoid this mechanism. Um, and for those of us that have been treating this illness and maybe have tried BiPAP, you probably now have seen patients with the sequela of lung damage, pneumomediastinums uh, and sub-Q air. Um, I've seen uh, in the beginning stages of COVID-19 now more pneumomediastinums and subcutaneous air than I've had in my prior uh, 15 years in practice. So again, really BiPAP not indicated in this patient population, uh, really only in very select patients that maybe in addition to their COVID are having COPD exacerbations, otherwise have hypercapnia, uh, or they have OSA, obesity hyperventilation syndrome, or again, acute uh, CHF exacerbations. And this is, uh, you know, since it's just so important, I just want to really reiterate why we're avoiding BiPAP here. And again, uh, it's due to barrel trauma via the two mechanisms of excessive tidal volumes and rapid, rapid respiratory rate, but also that it's an aspiration risk, as I alluded to earlier, and you really can't feed patients uh, on BiPAP. So then they develop malnutrition and they're more prone to sepsis um, if they aspirate and or they become uh, malnourished. Um, they're really unable to prone per current ARDS guidelines. Um, some centers have tried this, but really it's, it's against current guidelines at the moment. Um, we are unable to monitor plateau pressures or driving pressures, which are gonna be critically important as we talk about mechanical ventilation in this patient population. And we get mucus plugging, dry uh, airways, which leads to airway ulceration. Um, we have now seen numerous individuals that were placed on CPAP or BiPAP for extended periods of time and they have completely uh, dried out their oral mucosa from their lips all the way down to their vocal cords, and it has dried out and ulcerated, um, and intubation has become uh, quite difficult in this patient population when there are blood clots and the ulcerations really all throughout. So furthermore, even really before uh, we saw COVID, uh, there was already caution with non-invasive ventilation in ARDS. And um, just as one example of some of the literature, uh, this paper from Frat here, which compared high flow nasal cannula with supplemental oxygen using a non-rebreather mask of 10 liters per minute, uh, and with using non-invasive uh, ventilation with pressure support to retrieve a tidal volume between somewhere between seven and 10 mLs per kilogram. And what they noted was that there was a significant drop in intubation rate in the high flow nasal cannula group compared with supplemental oxygen um, and the non-invasive ventilation groups. Um, in the subgroup of patients who have ARDS, here defined as the PO2, uh, FiO2 ratio uh, of less than 200. And there was a mortality difference. Mortality was also significantly less in the high flow nasal cannula group um, as compared to others um, in both the supplemental oxygen as well as the non uh, as well as the non invasive ventilation group um, in the ICU after 90 days. Now, this uh, concept here of preventing lung damage with BiPAP and CPAP, um, if someone fails a uh, high flow nasal cannula, is so important that some centers have just gone straight to ECMO. Um, to try to further present, uh, prevent the lung damage of progression to L uh, to H type. Um, and so this is uh, pre-publication uh, data here. Um, and the ECMO program at Methodist Hospital in San Antonio has now had 85 runs of ECMO. Um, they have noticed that the longer that an individual um, uh, was on mechanical ventilation prior to going on ECMO, that that is associated with a much higher risk uh, of death and lung damage. And because of those observations, again, they have progressed this all the way to the point of now doing a trial to where individuals, uh, if they meet criteria, will go on ECMO before going on mechanical ventilation. So um, I've talked uh, uh, pretty uh, um, definitively about avoiding uh, BiPAP, but I, I did want to uh, show you some of the current guidelines in, ref in reference to this. And this is currently the NIH COVID guidelines. And here they talk about for adults with COVID-19 and acute hypoxic respiratory failure, despite conventional oxygen therapy, the panel recommends high flow nasal cannula oxygen over non-invasive positive pressure ventilation as the first intervention, uh, intervention as a B1 uh, level of evidence uh, right now. And really they only uh, uh, recommend uh, 
Um, uh, in the absence of an indication for endotracheal intubation, the panel recommends a closely monitored trial of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation for adults with COVID-19 and acute hypoxic respiratory failure for whom hypo, uh, high flow nasal cannula is not available, but this is a much lower uh, level of evidence at B3 and other guidelines which we're gonna review flat out just say don't even try it or maybe possibly just consider maybe CPAP for a short two hour trial or so to see if you get some recruitment and you can go back on high flow nasal cannula. So to this end, um, we can see here that the U.S. Department of Defense COVID management guidelines is pro high flow nasal cannula, and they recommend early intubation over non-invasive ventilation uh, because of the risk of silly. Um, and our U.S. surviving sepsis campaign SCCM uh, guidelines uh, mention that high flow nasal cannula is the next modality, and perhaps maybe suggest if high flow nasal cannula is unavailable, the patient's not tolerating it. Again, maybe perhaps a short trial of maybe CPAP or so of something like this. Um, but again, high flow nasal cannula is the first intervention. So now let's start to progress towards when to intubate. And I'll talk a little bit more about now how to monitor high flow nasal cannula uh, status uh, in this patient population um, with something called the ROCS index for those that might not be familiar with it. And the ROC score of less than 3.85 is 100% predictive of failure at 12 hours high flow nasal cannula. So for those uh, institutions that are currently not using uh, ROC scores, this can be very important, especially for those critical care doctors that are also monitoring patients on the floor that are on high flow nasal cannula, and you want an objective way to determine whether or not you need to watch, watch them closer or whether or not now they have definitively failed uh, treatment and require transport to the ICU, this is a great way to do it. And this comes out of this paper here in 2019. Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, in addition to the ROC score, we want to uh, monitor our PAO2s. And if we had PF ratios of less than 150, that's when we start to start thinking about the possible need for intubation. Again, these patients are tolerating hypoxemia better than anyone that we've seen before. And we have commonly allowed patients who are otherwise completely asymptomatic to go down to PO2s in the high 50s, low 60s, and many of these patients have turned around. But again, you're putting the whole picture together. You're not just looking at a number, you're looking at the individual. And if they truly are otherwise completely asymptomatic, perhaps that's appropriate. But once you go below this 150 PF ratio, if they have concomitant things, such as a high respiratory rate, uh, high tidal volumes where, they're, where they are damaging uh, their lungs via cilli. Um, um, that's when you start to consider intubation uh, at that point in time. Or if the patients become septic, or if they're on pressors, or they have myocardial uh, infarction or otherwise instability. Um, um, and here I mentioned perhaps if someone's starting to fail or so, you can maybe trial CPAP for two hours or so. Again, very careful monitoring of tidal volumes uh, in this pop pop patient population, you really want to see these patients return back to high flow nasal cannula. But if they're outside of safe ranges, um, then you cannot allow them to damage their lungs because you do not want them to progress from the L to the H type uh, ARDS. And down here, I just really emphasize the point that uh, at this moment in time, there really are no you know, absolutes and we're really putting all these together. So uh, clinical um, uh, gestalts are very important when you're looking at m all these different variables. So let's come back to that ROC score. So what exactly is it? So the ROC score is the ratio of oxygen saturation as measured by the pulse oximity symmetry divided by the FiO2 um, and then times respiratory rate. So here you see the formula uh, right here. And again, a ROC score greater than 4.88 at two, six, and 12 hours after high flow nasal cannula initiation is associated with a much lower rate uh, of intubation, um, and you can feel comfortable that this patient population is doing well. However, predictors of high flow nasal cannula failure include ROC scores less than 2.85 at two hours, less than 3.47 at six hours, and then less, point, less than 3.85 at 12 hours, which is what I showed on the prior slide. What you'll notice here is that there's a gap of uh, uh, from 3.85 up to 4.88 where that's when you have to watch these patients more closely uh, and really put the whole picture together because 
Um, we don't um, have a definitive uh, pulse on what the respiratory failure is rate within that range. And again, you need to look at the patient and put all the variables together uh, at that time. So I had mentioned that the ROC score originally came out um, uh, for the ARDS patient population uh, before COVID-19. But what about validation in COVID-19? Well, like most of you, um, we are, I just have a voracious appetite for the literature and we uh, need information on the front lines as quickly as possible. So many of us have now progressed from uh, published uh, information to now also looking at information that has been submitted for peer review. And so this paper is not yet in publication. It has been submitted for peer review. Um, and this is from Temple University. Um, in which they looked at uh, individuals from this date range here with moderate to severe respiratory failure treated with high flow nasal cannula therapy. Um, and the high flow nasal cannula uh, patients were divided into two groups, those that were on high flow nasal cannula only and those with high flow nasal cannula that progressed to requirement for mechanical ventilation. And the primary outcome was the ability of the ROX index to predict the need for mechanical ventilation. And so of the 837 patients that they looked at, 129 met criteria, and the age was uh, approximately 60.8. And what they found was that a ROCS index of less, less than five, this shouldn't be confusing, before we said 4.88, and they just simply rounded it up here, just maybe for a little more convenience, was predictive of progression to mechanical ventilation, um, as we saw uh, in the original validation uh, study from 2019. But again, now this is specific to COVID. We also found that any decrease in ROCS index after high flow nasal cannula was initiated was predictive of intubation. Um, and in addition to the change in ROCS score, peak D-dimer concentration greater than 4,000, admission GFR less than 60 were also strongly predictive of need for mechanical ventilation. Uh, perhaps here, maybe this is showing you the D-dimer, um, their risk for microthrombotic disease or other vascular uh, endothelial dysfunction um, that makes them more likely to progress from L to H type because it's so severe. And perhaps maybe the low GFR shows that these individuals may have a harder time with fluid balance um, and become fluid overloaded, uh, further worsening um, their ability to oxygenate and require high flow, uh, require mechanical ventilation. Uh, here, the mortality rate was 11.2% in the high flow nasal cannula group versus 47.5% in the group that required mechanical ventilation. So here, just as an overview of what we talked about, and this is as a prelude for us to now to you know, transition over to intubation and how to manage mechanical ventilation, we talked about, again, just briefly, individuals are admitted and they require supplemental oxygen. If they have a PF ratio uh, of you know, around greater 150 or so, or less than 150, but they are happy hypoxemic and they otherwise look completely asymptomatic, then go to um, high flow nasal cannula um, as the preferred mechanism over non-invasive ventilation. Maybe only consider CPAP um, or BiPAP if the individual has our classic indications such as COPD, um, acute uh, congestive heart failure, exacerbations. And again, if you do, monitor your tidal volumes uh, very closely. Um, uh, otherwise, just continue with high flow nasal cannula here. And again, monitor your ROCS indexes to know whether or not a patient is at risk of failure and requires early intubation. Um, uh, here, um, if you are gonna do non-invasive ventilation, really it's a uh, preference towards CPAP, uh, again, because obviously the BiPAP has that bi-mode uh, additional pressure that can make the patient uh, more easily susceptible to self-induced lung injury. And if all this fails, um, if their ROCS index is low and they fail high flow nasal cannula, um, or they otherwise um, have high respiratory rates, uh, or they are hurting themselves um, with psyllium, then progress with endotracheal intubation. So again, when are we gonna consider intubation as we now progress over to how to manage them on the ventilator? Uh, you start to think about it when the PF ratios go below 150. Again, we're allowing some patients to go well below this as long as we're putting the whole picture together. But when they start to blow uh, 150 or so, that's when it has to start being on your radar. In certain select patient populations, which we'll talk about, start thinking of ECMO early when the PF ratios are 80 or less. Um, and again, uh, we want early ECMO and we'll review that one more time. Um, if their chest X-ray shows that now they have ventilator-induced um, uh, uh, lung injury or silly, 
Um, uh, if they uh, were not intubated yet, go ahead and intubate them at the time because they are showing that they're going to hurt themselves um, via silly uh, mechanisms. If their ROX index is less than 3.8, uh, again, if they're on pressors or septic or they have uh, cardiac instability, uh, if they have altered mental status, which again is up to about 30% prevalent in this patient population, or they otherwise cannot manage uh, their secretions, uh, manage their airway, if they have high tidal volumes on non-invasive ventilation. Um, and uh, this is just some information from the CDC showing that as, we pro as patients progress in age um, from uh, 50 uh, all the way up to the 85 and older category here, their risk of hospitalization is much higher. And unfortunately, uh, currently, their risk of death is much higher as well um, in that, um, which is included by my picture here, in the uh, 85 to uh, older patient population, their risk of death is up to 630 times higher than individuals that are younger. So now we've progressed to mechanical ventilation, and we want to now uh, focus on ARGENET, plateau pressures, and drive pr driving pressures as the mechanism to manage uh, these patients. And so the first mechanism to prevent ventilator-induced lung injury is the foul ARGENET. And so what we want to do is, in general, low tidal volume uh, lung protective strategies between four and eight mLs per kilogram, and we'll talk about the differences between L and H, uh, H types where you might be able to have higher tidal volumes in the L type. But again, this is on ideal body weight, not actual body weight. And this is important. Um, we're starting to approach up to 50% of the US patient population being uh, obese. And so we cannot go by actual body weight. It is ideal body weight. That's something that we need to remind uh, our respiratory therapists. And so we're defining here the type L um, ARDS, again, as a normal compliance, but also with plateau pressures of 29 or less. And if they are an L-type with a normal compliance, we can likely tolerate the higher tidal volumes within the ARDS uh, paradigm, you know, around, you know, up to 8 mLs per kilo. However, the H-type, they have plateau pressures of 30 or greater. Um, and here in this uh, patient population, since they have stiffer lungs, we're really uh, going to find it very hard to be able to allow that patient um, to go up to higher tidal volumes. We're probably not going to be able to get their driving pressures where they need to be. And so we're going to tend to have that patient population at the lower range between four, maybe six at the most uh, cc's per kilo. It's important to mention here that in our obese, uh, obesity population that we can allow plateau pressures of 35 um, uh, uh, which is different than our non-obese population, which we target around 30 or so. Um, and uh, for our uh, obese population, they'll automatically go to the high P protocol. Um, and or if someone has an initial plateau pressure of greater than uh, 30, they'll go towards the high P protocol. And you'll see that this is because in order to maintain our driving pressures, it would be very difficult to do so um, if we follow the low P protocol in individuals who have very high initial uh, uh, plateau pressures. Now, we need ventilator compliance. It, it's an absolute must. And so we need to adequately sedate this patient population. Um, uh, most recent data says that maybe neuromuscular blockade is not needed. Because um, uh, really the concept is, is ventilator synchrony uh, and ventilator tolerance. And so if you're able to do that with sedative mechanisms only, then you're fine. And really only consider neuromuscular blockade if you're not able to have ventilator synchrony with uh, adequate sedation. And then even then when you go towards uh, neuromuscular blocking uh, agents, perhaps maybe consider bolus dosing um, as you're working towards uh, a better sedation reckon, uh, a mechanism. This way you limit the amount of time that uh, they're under neuromuscular blockade. Perhaps only during early phase, uh, phases, uh, try to recruit lung when lung is more recruitable. Um, you'll probably find it easier to recruit uh, lung in the L-type as compared to the H-type. Um, we want to prone uh, this patient population with PF ratios uh, less than uh, 150. And again, um, uh, if patients meet criteria, early ECMO, um, really as soon as possible. Um, certainly, uh, a goal should be less than 72 hours of mechanical ventilation before initiation of ECMO if they meet uh, criteria. So now really, in, in addition to the plateau pressures, this is the second most important concept to follow, which is to focus on driving pressures to reduce ventilator-induced uh, lung injury. 
And this is really currently becoming uh, really the gold standard for lung protective strategies as described by a motto in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. And our driving pressure is very simple. It's just simple, simply the difference between our plateau pressures and our PEEP. So it's the pressure due to respiratory compliance uh, in tidal volume. So it's very easy to monitor. And what we want to do is maintain a pressure of less than 15. And in order to do that, what we do is we increase the PEEP and our lower tidal volumes, again, to keep that driving pressure of less than 15. And the whole concept here is to prevent that cytokine uh, ventilator-induced uh, lung injury. So again, plateau pressures is what will follow um, with our ArgeNet uh, uh, a normal criteria, but then we're gonna uh, switch over into following our driving pressures and maintaining those driving pressures less than 15. So um, what we uh, reviewed here for mechanical ventilation is that if a COVID-19 patient uh, does require uh, mechanical ventilation, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna check compliance upon initiation to differentiate between the uh, L and the H type. Um, and again, if the patient is obese, we're gonna allow plat higher plateau pressures up to 35 instead of 30. Um, that L-type uh, ARDS, again, is a preserved respiratory system compliance of 50 mLs uh, per centimeter of water. And we could likely allow higher tidal volumes um, uh, in this patient population for better, for better ventilator synchrony while monitoring uh, driving uh, uh, pressures. And they could usually go up to around eight cc's per kilogram. The H type is respiratory system compliance of less than 50 mLs per centimeter of water and or high initial plateau pressures uh, between 30 and 35. And because they're gonna go on the high P protocol and they have stiffer lungs, you're likely gonna need to focus on smaller tidal volumes, um, less than six cc's you know, down to four. So once we're on mechanical ventilation again, we're gonna maintain driving pressures of less than 15. Um, in the L-type by using the low peak protocol ARDS, in the H-type by using the high peak protocol ARDS. When we have PF ratios less than 150, we're gonna do a prone positioning and make sure we have strict ventilator synchrony uh, per what I mentioned on the prior slide. And if a patient meets criteria and their PF ratio is less than, uh, less than 80, consider early ECMO, again, less than 72 hours of ECMO, uh, of mechanical ventilation um, to have the best chances of survival on ECMO. So now a patient's intubated and how do we optimize extubation in this uh, patient population? Well, perhaps maybe this paper might give a little insight to allow us to have some greater successes. Um, and this was a multi-center randomized clinical trial conducted from April of 2017 to January 2018 among 641 patients at high risk of extubation failure um, who are 65 years uh, or older with underlying cardiac or respiratory disease in 30 ICUs in France. Um, and what they showed was that in mechanically ventilated patients at high risk of extubation failure, which is almost all of our COVID-19 patients, the use of high-flow nasal cannula with non-invasive uh, ventilation immediately after extubation significantly decreased the risk of reintubation compared with high-flow nasal cannula alone. So I know I spent a lot of time talking about um, avoiding uh, non-invasive uh, positive pressure ventilation, but here as a temporary bridge, one, two, maybe three hours or so to where you're kind of um, elongating the runway for these patients to transition off traditional mechanical ventilation into breathing on their own, perhaps this appears to be reasonable, again, for a short period of time immediately after extubation. So um, really the take home point for the ECMO is early ECMO, less than 72 hours. And uh, we're talking here about VV ECMO, and this is the patient population that normally would have gone on VV ECMO, but now we're including uh, COVID-19 patients. Relative contraindications for most sites that run ECMO programs is age greater than 70. Some use a cutoff of 65. And again, look at this prolonged mechanical ventilation. The longer they're on mechanical ventilation, the higher the risk for ventilator associated lung injury, especially if we're not following driving pressures. Um, and that's why it's a contraindication to uh, ECMO. Um, and relative indication at least. And here, uh, contraindications are the requirement for VA ECMO, high BMIs, and the other things here are mainly things such as uh, incurable cancer or other conditions uh, in which the patient's long-term survivability is uh, not thought to be there outside of their respiratory failure. So now what about 
tracheostomy and when to progress to tracheostomy. Well, this is from our American College of Chest Physicians. Um, this was published in October of, uh, of just this year, 2020. Um, and here they say that this panel suggests performing tracheostomy in patients expected to require prolonged mechanical ventilation. Uh, however, they didn't talk about a specific timing of tracheostomy um, uh, at this time. So this first step was important because there were many sites that thought that there was no benefit to tracheostomy whatsoever. And here we have one of our premier critical care uh, societies coming out and saying that tracheostomy is indeed recommended, but again, at the time when prolonged mechanical ventilation is deemed needed. So, you know, I talked about um, at the time when prolonged mechanical ventilation is deemed needed, um, perhaps maybe that could be early. Um, um, uh, it is known in certain patient populations that early uh, tracheostomy might be appropriate, and that could be appropriate in some of your COVID-19 patients, uh, and we do want to put that on the table. Here, I just show that for one example of early tracheostomy in um, a respiratory failure patient population, COPD, um, this was uh, shown here at our last uh, chest meeting, again, of this year in October. And they found here that early tracheostomy before the ninth day in mechanically ventilated COPD patients was associated with lower 90-day old cores in hospital mortality and hospital length of stay. So uh, you don't necessarily have to uh, have prolonged mechanical ventilation um, in COVID-19 patients before considering possibly early tracheostomy in select patients. So let's talk about maybe some possible specific COVID-19 advantages of tracheostomy. And so here, there are several potential advantages to tracheostomy. I really wanna emphasize potential. Some of the information here uh, are, uh, are potential and some areas are controversial. Um, so a first one here would be to the ability to decrease or eliminate sedation. And this will definitely happen with tracheostomies. And why is this imp important for our COVID-19 patient population? Because then we can have better neurological exams in patients who are known to be at risk for thrombotic complications. So this is very important. Um, we can have better ventilator synchrony because they require less sedation and it's more comfortable for them to have a tracheostomy than an endotracheal tube. Um, uh, this is uh, clearly evident here. We can promote early mobility in this patient population. And again, this is important because this could possibly decrease the risk of thrombotic complications. Again, in COVID-19 patients who are at higher risk for thrombotic uh, complications. We will decrease dead space ventilation, and perhaps that might provide our ability to more quickly go on high flow nasal cannula um, or high flow type mechanisms um, via the trach instead of via the nasal passages with the tracheostomy. And uh, uniquely so, since we're now below the uh, vocal cords, you might be able to have a higher fraction of oxygen with high flow nasal cannula, again, because there's less dead space below the vocal cords. And you might be able to have slightly higher peeps, again, less dead space, you're below the vocal cords. Um, the flows could be a little more powerful, perhaps maybe with 60 liters of flows, you might be able to start approach seven or eight of peep instead of the six that I had quoted earlier. Um, now, this is controversial, but you possibly could have a decrease in ventilator-associated uh, uh, pneumonia. Um, you could possibly have decreased duration of mechanical ventilation um, in that you could more aggressively try to get these patients off mechanical ventilation. And this can be appropriate because, again, these are happy hypoxemic patients. And so being more aggressive with them, which you can more easily do with a tracheostomy, might be reasonable. There could be possibly a mortality benefit um, uh, with tracheostomy. And something that does need to be mentioned during the time that we're all experiencing so, uh, surges is that there could be rationing of researches, uh, resources in COVID-19 um, in a triage care situation um, with tracheostomy in that you will require less sedation um, and perhaps maybe you can free up some mechanical ventilators. So we hope that we don't have to go here but it's important to at least mention that that could be one additional advantage. So now we wanna be a little more specific. When to offer COVID-19 patient a tracheostomy? So as we saw the chest guidelines, they said that when prolonged ventilator management is deemed needed, uh, tracheostomy is recommended. So what do we know from other you know, patient populations? Well, proceeding without delay at the time prolonged mechanical ventilation is deemed uh, uh, to have perhaps advantages in several other patient populations that we know, such as traumatic brain injury patients, 
uh, or other severe neurological impairment patients, COPD patients per uh, what I showed you prior. So then the question is, is when would the assessment of prolonged mechanical ventilation requirement be made in a COVID-19 patient? And here I'm gonna postulate that perhaps that's when maybe a patient progresses from the L-type to the H-type ARDS. As the H-type ARDS in COVID-19 patients are likely to require much longer mechanical ventilation. So at the time that they are deemed clearly H, perhaps maybe starting to consider tracheostomy there. So now, how to perform tracheostomy um, in this patient population? Well, the first thing is, is the percutaneous approach. There is no need to take these patients to the operating room um, and to risk exposure uh, with transport and in the OR. So at the bedside, percutaneous approach is recommended. We wanna paralyze these patients. Um, and that's simply uh, because we wanna ensure that they do not cough um, and see the room um, at the time of their procedure. And we also really wanna just absolutely maximize the operating conditions so that uh, you have uh, the quickest first pass success uh, with your procedure um, and you can allow people to exit the room as quickly as possible. Um, I'm gonna talk here about drawing the anatomy, the use of ultrasound. Um, you wanna have the most experienced operators perform tracheostomies. And so now at our institution, um, um, between myself and uh, my main partner, we uh, currently uh, are doing tracheostomies in less than five minutes. Um, many of them are done in about two and a half minutes or so. And um, uh, again, this can easily be done if you just have the individuals with the most experience do them. And here I'm just gonna uh, mention briefly that in, at the time of doing the tracheostomy, um, now for critical care doctors, we can do percutaneous ultrasound guided gastrostomy tubes um, instead of peg tubes. So a feeding tube just placed with ultrasound and to consider doing that at the same time under the same um, paralysis that you gave and the same sedation that you're using. Um, it's likely best for the patient to have both at the same time. So here's an example of drawing the anatomy and this is what we do here. And uh, we draw the anatomy based upon here. We wanna know what the cricoid um, uh, mem a membrane is and where the uh, cricoid cartilage is, what the first tracheal ring is, the second, the third, and the fourth. And why is this important? Because you want to build in as many redundancies as possible when you're doing uh, a surgery to where you could be all gowned up, ready to go, and your ultrasound machine goes out. But if you're ready to draw the anatomy, you have another backup mechanism. And so this is important because again, you want first pass success as high and as quickly as possible. So this redundancy is worth doing. And now again, to have first pass success, to have needle go into the trachea the first time, now really recommend the use of ultrasound. And so this is an out of uh, plane uh, view here. And you can see how easy it's gonna be to get your needle straight in because you can see um, where midline is. There's no more guessing with just palpation alone. Um, you will be able to get first pass success with greater than 99% with use of ultrasound here. However, ultrasound is also useful for an out of plane approach. So as we know, we wanna go in between the second and third tracheal rings. And so here you can see the anatomy where you see the cricoid uh, uh, um, cartilage right here. You see the first tracheal ring, the second, the third, and the fourth. And in some patients with a big enough neck, you can actually have direct um, in, uh, in plane needle entry right here um, between the second and third rings. And this is wonderful when you're able to do this because then you prevent uh, fracturing of the tracheal rings um, if you otherwise had your needle go through one of the tracheal rings. Um, and if the patient has a very, very thin neck and doing a direct in plane approach uh, is not possible, you can still at least get this picture here, mark exactly where you wanna go and have the same benefit. In addition to this, uh, we're still using bronchoscopy uh, guidance, but here you can see the endotracheal tube. And so you can help your colleague who's doing the bronchoscopy when they're pulling back the endotracheal tube and you can tell them when their endotracheal tube is now out of your area to where you're gonna go. So now here we come to our last slide and this is a summary of everything we discussed. So what's crucially important is, is we wanna monitor our tidal virus by using ideal body weight whether that's with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or with mechanical ventilation, we really need to avoid that stretch injury in these patients and uh, us causing them harm uh, when we're trying to help them oxygenate and uh, progressing their respiratory failure. 
we want to monitor their ABGs, but recall that these are happy hypoxemic patients and they might have several compensatory mechanisms that are kicking in and they look remarkably well for their level uh, of hypoxemia and we really need to put the whole picture together as we're carefully monitoring these patients. We want to check our ROC, in, ROCS index upon initiation of high flow nasal cannula and we want to track it. Um, the number that was really important here is um, uh, greater than 4.88. It appears as if they're stable and if they fall below 4.88 we need to watch them very carefully. Specifically, I talked about checking the ROCS index at two, six, and 12 hours, and then approximately every six hours thereafter. And if the ROCS index falls below 3.85 at 12 hours, and that is an indication of intubation, or if it falls below the numbers that I presented above at the two and six hour mark. Also recall here that there is a slight gap between the 4.88 and the 3.85 to where the predictive value of using the rocks um, is not as accurate um, for safety with greater than 4.88 or with uh, need for intubation below 3.85 here. And so for these patients, we need to watch them very closely and use more clinical judgment. We want to avoid BiPAP for that self-induced lung injury, again, except for if it's one of our known uh, typical disease states that we treat if that's concomitant with COVID, such as COPD exacerbations and or acute CHF exacerbations. Uh, it appears that CPAP is safer than BiPAP, but even if we do this, maybe we trial it for something like two hours or so. Uh, at, at the minimum, we fluctuate it between high flow nasal cannula and this. And if we do do it, we want to be very careful and monitor tidal volumes. Again, we want our tidal volumes 9 mLs or less. Uh, per kilogram. And in order to do that, we want to put alarms um, on our uh, CPAP machine here. Um, so it triggers uh, if they go above um, that nine number. Um, we do want to consider uh, early intubation if any of these measures fail, if the patient is clearly causing harm, self-induced lung injury, or if their ROCS index uh, uh, indicates otherwise, or if they have clinical findings such as altered mental status, just like a patient can have self-induced lung injury with the pressure, um, they could have lung injury if they are struggling uh, to breathe and we prolong intubation. Um, uh, so really our decision to intubate uh, should come sooner uh, than later as long um, as um, uh, we follow one of these metrics here uh, and when it's indicated. Uh, we do want to offer tracheostomy uh, when it's anticipated that we're going to have prolonged mechanical ventilation, and we define prolonged mechanical ventilation here as an individual who is now well within the H-type ARDS, those stiff lungs, um, to where they know that they'll need uh, excessive amounts of time before they can come off mechanical ventilation. And it's important that we have our palliative care uh, colleagues uh, consult uh, on these patients to address code status um, and to have goals of care conversation. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. And if you have any feedback, uh, please do uh, send me an email um, and let me know about it. Thank you so much for watching and learning with us today. If you're interested in taking this class for credit, or if you're interested in our other services, such as our direct clinical care services, please visit our website at www.med-specialist.net or click on the link in the description below. Also, make sure you subscribe to our channel to stay up to date on our most current content and educational opportunities.